I'm Jordan Copeland, Associate Village Historian for Scarsdale, New York, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of the long history of Black people in Edgemont. New York relied heavily on slavery for 200 years, all the way from when it was a Dutch colony starting in 1626 and not ending until 1827. Farmers and early settlers in Westchester depended on the labor of enslaved Africans who were one-fifth of the colonial population of New York. And this image depicts them down here at the bottom, almost figuratively holding up the colony. In 1790, in the first American census, in all of Greenberg, there were 616 white people, 122 enslaved black people, about one-fifth of the total population, and just nine free people of color. They didn't do the census back then, teasing out Edgemont as a separate census area, so you kind of have to estimate, but looking at this, Edgemont is estimated to be about one-tenth of the total Greenberg population. So if I had to estimate how many enslaved black people there were in Edgemont then, I would guess about a dozen, with a white population of about 60. I do see that members of the Odell and Underhill families enslaved people at that time. Now, the remnants of slavery in Edgemont can be seen today, this home at 221 Old Army Road. It was built in 1740 by Israel Hunt and his son Joshua. They were tenants of Frederick Phillips, who was the Lord of Phillipsburg Manor. You can still see the slave quarters back here. This is what they look like today. It's a small building. The exterior is about 9 by 12 feet. You couldn't say that it's completely original because it's been in use in various purposes for 270 years and repaired as need be. And interestingly, if you look Look here, you can see the slave quarters back here in the current view, and it doesn't appear to have had a window back then in this picture from 1910. So these windows may be a 20th century alteration. Here's the interior. We're looking up to the second level. Down below in a second, you'll see it does have a fireplace and a stone floor. The second floor up here was used for sleeping, and it housed up to eight enslaved people. This is the view down from above. So while large plantations in the South had sizable groups of enslaved people, this was much rarer in New York. In rural areas like Edgemont, enslaved people would have been often very isolated, as there were fewer opportunities for them to socialize with other black people, to form families, and to keep in contact with other family members when they wound up being separated from them, you know, as uh, other members would have been sold as property and sent somewhere far away. Moving forward to rural Edgemont, um, even after New York banned slavery effective 1827, there were still laws compelling the return of black people who fled north toward Canada. Regarding the Underground Railroad, I'm generally skeptical of stories of tunnels and secret compartments in old homes, um, just because that's an awfully nice narrative to have about an old home. I haven't seen evidence of the Underground Railroad going through Edgemont. Now, during that time, Scarsdale did have a black population in the Quaker part of town, and the Quakers, we know, did participate in the Underground Railroad, as well as abolitionism and seeking equal rights for women. And you can see here, here's a picture from 1890, the old Quaker school, and you see in the right corner there were five black students over to the Greenville School. Edgemont didn't have that Quaker settlement or African-American presence. All these kids appear to be white. When you look at the 1860 census, it shows Edgemont as a farming community, and black people were not a substantial presence, but they were always present, including this noteworthy one on the right here in the middle, it looks like Andrew Steadwell, who shows up here as he, there's a value of real estate, meaning that he owned land rather than just being a tenant. I believe that he was on Old Army Road, um, and there's also, you can see Odell and Seeley and Underhill at here as well. This is a Scarsdale chart, but I think you're going to see the same thing for Edgemont. The white population grew, while the black population largely did not. But what I would like to introduce you to is the black family that was here the longest and was perhaps the most engaged in the community, and this is the Stewart family. Parents Abraham and Sadie, and the boys Charles and Louis. They first appear in the 1900 census, renting a home in the former schoolhouse at 450 
Fort Hill Road. The Stuarts came up to Westchester from mid-Atlantic states, which was common for black people in this area at that time. Abraham may have been born into slavery in 1850 in South Carolina, but he could read and write according to the census. The family attended the Greenville Reformed Church, which was then, as now, an accepting place. And you can see here, starting in 1906, Abraham advertised a family laundry in the Scarsdale Inquirer. Platt Avenue is now Ardsley Road. And they were mentioned a number of times in the Inquirer in the Christmas exercises at the Greenville School in 1903, being part of the recitations. Both Charles and Lewis had a part. And then there were a couple of small notes about them in the Inquirer in 1906, when their two-month-old daughter, Henrietta, died of bronchitis. And then eight months later, when Sadie and Lewis and Charles went back down to Virginia for a visit. By 1917, the sons have registered for World War I. Here are their draft cards. Charles is 23, and he's a cook on the New York Central Railroad. And Lewis, who's 21, is a farmhand for the nearby Detterer Dairy Farm. It appears Abraham has died, as Lewis requests an exemption from service to support his mother and brother. I'll point out one thing that I hadn't noticed when I looked at these cards. Just note these cut corners. For context of black American life at that time, note this registration card for Dick Wilson, a white man who I'll get to in a minute. Down in the lower left-hand corner, it says, if person is of African descent, tear off this corner. The two Stuart brothers, had they gone into World War I, been designated for segregated units, which were often assigned to menial labor. The armed forces weren't desegregated until 1948. Here's an image of the Dedero Dairy Farm in 1920, so this would have been where Lewis was working at that time. In 1923, at age 27, Lewis joins the Greenville Volunteer Fire Company, and apparently they rewrote the bylaws of the fire company to allow him in, changing the old rule that members had to be, quote, free, white, and 21. He served for at least 25 years. This is about 1925. The infant is Charles Park, who later became fire chief. And around this time, Lewis was partners with Dick Wilson, whose draft card I showed you a minute ago, running a dairy farm on the site of the Greenville School on Ardsley Road, on land leased from the Levinus family. By 1930, from the census, you can see he identifies himself as a dairy farmer rather than a farmhand, and he's moved across Central Avenue, buying land off of Old Army Road from John Hosier. The house is opposite 20 Robin Hill Road, but Lewis's house doesn't have a house number. And you can see the home data here, the ownership status is there. Lewis and Charles are also joined by their cousin, Henry Hollinside, who was in school, I believe, in Bronxville at that time. And the parents aren't there on the census anymore, but one mystery is that I found from 1933, this ad here at the bottom, it could have been Sadie, his mom, she would have been 67 at that time, seeking work as a housekeeper with a family. Here's the location of where Lewis's land was. Currently, it's where Thomas Lane would meet Edgemont Circle. I spoke with a woman named Laura George who lived on Robin Hill Road, and she describes in 1955 that this whole area was only woods and swamp that she would cut through, and that there had been a pond there that she knew as Louis Pond. But she said there were ducks and geese back there. It was very wild, fox and deer, and that there was barely anybody living there going back from Robin Hill Road to... Old Army Road, but to the side of Louis Pond was a one-story wooden house, which would be this one right here on the map. The map's from 1930. And uh, one day she went to sell them seeds, and she found there an older black couple with no electricity. There was a wood stove. She saw the smoke coming out of the chimney and a kerosene lamp. They had a little yard and a lilac bush, and the remains from an old windmill was there. And there was a wide pipe underground that had been the stream bed. She described the woman dressed in what seemed like a stiff lace bib. Her skirt was mid-calf, a very antiquated look, and he dressed also countryish. Could this have been Lewis? I don't know. Um, I haven't been able to been able to track him past about 1948 when we know that he was still in the area and he died in 1977 in New Rochelle.
By the 1930s, black people were coming up often from the mid-Atlantic states to be domestic workers in Westchester. Edgemont was developing rapidly. This area that I'm going to talk about here is called Edgemont Hills. On the right side is Central Avenue. Coming up the middle here is Fort Hill Road. In the 1920s, Joshua Cockburn was a wealthy captain of a black crewed steamship and he and his wife Pauline, pictured here, lived in Harlem. In 1932, they purchased land and built a house in Edgemont Hills. After the house was built, they were sued by a neighbor because the original deed covenants for Edgemont Hills said that, quote, Negroes, end quote, could only reside in the neighborhood as servants and could not own or otherwise use the property. Now, a quote in the Scarsdale Inquirer from a neighbor said that no one bore the Cockburns any personal antipathy, but their presence and that of other black people would harm real estate values. You could see here a bunch of quotes that I've highlighted in, in yellow, but talking about people backing out of deals and so on. An adjacent development has lost two sales directly to traceable to the fact that the Cockburns live on Fort Hill Road. I don't know how that could actually be proven, but this seemed to be the common belief. The Cockburns were represented by Arthur Garfield Hayes of the ACLU and a young Thurgood Marshall from the NAACP. The New York Times of March 23, 1937 reported that residents of the Edgemont Hills neighborhood packed the courtroom because they wanted to see the deed covenant honored. In 1937, the Cockburns lost, forfeiting the right to live in the house that they themselves had built. Discriminatory deed covenants weren't found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court until 1948. Judge Parsons Davis ruled that Pauline Cockburn had violated the deed covenant because she had at least one-eighth Negro blood, and her husband Joshua was just obviously a Negro based on his appearance. This is the house today. The only silver lining is that Pauline and Joshua Cockburn were allowed to stay there because their lawyer was pretty crafty, and he convinced the plaintiffs that he was going to win the case on appeal, which would result in more black people moving to Edgemont Hills. So he kind of used the neighbor's racism against her and she never actually filed the judgment. So there was nothing to appeal. So they were able to live there for a few more years. The Scarsdale Inquirer wrote about the case, but really without any opinionated comment and there weren't any letters of support or outrage in the paper. You can see here the anchor that Joshua Cockburn placed in front of his home. It's still there. So what I found perplexing in this research is how is it that earlier, Lewis Stewart could join the fire company, partner with a white man in business, and buy two and a half acres back in the 1920s. But in the 30s, things seemed to be going backwards, and a wealthy black couple isn't even allowed to live in Edgemont, almost across the street from where the Stewart family had originally lived for over two decades. And the answer to this has to do with the nature of suburbia. That farmland wasn't restricted, and its value is based on what you can extract from the land. Suburban homes' value is based on aesthetic and other considerations, and these developments allowed for legally binding racism in the form of these restrictive covenants. Now, I'm not saying that everything was always better before. Black people have been harassed and have crosses burned on their lawns without deed restrictions, including there was a cross burning in 1930 in White Plains when a black dentist, Errol Collymore, bought a house in a white neighborhood. But what these covenants did is gave this legal force and the veneer that it was just about property values and had nothing to do with racism. What I should point out is that the same considerations do happen today. So my antenna go up when I hear people talking about maintaining property values because it can be a way of really talking about something else and that you can say you're not racist, but you will cater to others' racism. It's not always, but it can be. Suburbanization in this area largely excluded black people. Black residency in Scarsdale and Edgemont as well was limited largely to domestic servants, and they didn't share in the benefit of building wealth by owning a home and passing it down for generations. They were employed here, and they sometimes lived in at their employer's pleasure, but they generally didn't send kids to the schools and they didn't have the same stake in the community. You can see here on the chart, the black population is going up from the 20s up through 1940, but the percentage of black households is going down. This is the representation of live-in servants who are living in 
white people's homes. There were issues with retaining servants and not paying enough to retain them. According to a 1930 survey in the Scarsdale Inquirer, there was, quote, unquestionably a preference for white servants. And you can see here these terrible quotes that people were quoted in the paper as saying about the habits or uh, these tropes about laziness. They believed that once they were paid, they would essentially quit and just sit on that money till it was gone and then go back to work again, um, idling themselves. And over here on the upper right, you see a letter from an Edgemont reader saying that giving salary information out gives too much information to quote a certain class of the colored maids. In other words, if you tell how much people are paying and they know that, then they'll be able to be paid more. You can see down here in the lower right that even in the 50s, an Enquirer help wanted ad from a family seeking a white cook. In the late 1960s, we had very different public conversations about integration. As you might know, periodically, Edgemont residents have sought to incorporate. And in the late 1960s, that effort was criticized as a means to exclude public housing. I've been told that Edgemont's attempted incorporation then was, in fact, driven by a fear that the town of Greenberg would seek to build low-income housing and active recreational facilities like a pool along Central Avenue in Edgemont that would attract black Greenberg residents. The incorporation effort that year failed, and Greenberg did not, in fact, create low-income housing or active recreational facilities in Edgemont. There is a disturbing video that you can find online where a former Greenberg town councilman appears to acknowledge efforts to steer affordable housing and recreational facilities away from Edgemont but I don't have the investigative capacity to say authoritatively what happened. Um, you can look it up and uh, make up your own mind on that one. But on the other hand, there was an awareness that black people were underrepresented in Edgemont and an understanding of how their absence negatively impacts everyone, including those white students who aren't prepared for a multicultural society if they don't go to school with black students. Here's an article describing the report of the Edgemont Community Committee on Education, Subcommittee for the Study of Integration Programs, urging the Board of Ed to do more in terms of integration. The subcommittee report recommends the adoption of certain procedures. It doesn't go all the way towards integration as we know it or busing. It's a little bit more limited in scope, seeking teacher development, increased contact between Edgemont students and the minority group members who are in other schools. But there were efforts such as the STEP program. The Student Transfer Education Program was established in 1970, modeled off one next door in Scarsdale, to enable black students from segregated schools in the South to finish their high school in Edgemont, living with local families. You can see on the right how the program is described as benefiting multiple constituencies, benefiting the black youth who would get better schooling than in their home communities, but also the opportunity for families to learn, share, and grow in hosting the students, as well as Edgemont High School students to study and work with black students whom they otherwise would not encounter. So this is the big view of the population trends to help you put it all together. This is Scarsdale, but the chart for Edgemont would be similar. You can see here how the black resident percentage in Scarsdale was much higher in the early part of the 19th century. It went down, you have this little bubble of live and help, and then it's low. Really, it's lower now than it has been in the entire settled history of Scarsdale. Now, Edgemont is substantially diverse, particularly with people of Asian and Pacific Islander descent. I think it's about a third of the population. But Edgemont is still between 2 and 3% black, while the entire town of Greenberg is much higher, around 13%, in some areas, like the historically black part of the town named Fairview, is about three-fourths black. I want to point out in this presentation one thing that I'm missing, and that I'm really missing the most important part of what I had in my Scarsdale presentation, which is black voices themselves. So I urge you to check out that presentation because there's fascinating themes of keeping a connection to your culture, being underestimated, having to decide to speak up alone or stay silent in the face of racism. There are stories of warmth and great friends and there are stories of being profiled and called racial slurs. And it's a story of individuals who've shown grace and strength and resilience and humor, but also 
black parents making difficult choices that other parents don't, and of the interviewees who have kids, some have chosen places like Edgemont to raise their kids, and others have chosen more diverse settings where their children aren't the only black kids in their class or grade. So I incorporated some of them into my Scarsdale presentation, but it only scratches the surface. So the full interviews are online as well, and you can find them on my channel. Here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. The entire Black People in Scarsdale presentation is here. Other than the full interviews, they're really, really great. And special thanks to David Stern, Dylan Pine, Laura George, and Charles Park Jr. for their help. I hope this opened your eyes to the history of Black people in Edgemont. It's a very abridged version, but hopefully it gives you something to think about going forward. All right, take care.